So now we're going to talk about ecological functions. So we can grow it, we can watch it die, we can watch it fall down, but what exactly does it do? What is, what is its ecological role? And Gordy Reeves is going to be talking about that. He's a research ecologist with the PNW Research Station here in Corvallis. Help me welcome Gordy Reeves, please. Well, well the, the talk is going to be short. Not much um, is the answer. Um, in terms of what, what's new. But actually there are a few things that are new and I think what I'm going to do is not bore you with a, an exhaustive review of what wood does, but try to touch on some newer um, functions that have been identified here, I think, recently and some that maybe are more well identified than others. Okay, so one, it's simply like, I think you may have seen some of this earlier, is, is, the, is the sources of wood. You know, one of the things we know is that, that wood is coming from different areas. It doesn't come equally from just the stream adjacent riparian zone. It doesn't equally come from upslope. It, it, it varies across the landscape. And this is moving into this whole idea of the ecological context, which will develop in, in two talks from now uh, in, in more fully. But what I think what's important to think about is these wood sources also dictate to a large degree how the wood behaves and what happens in, in response uh, to what happens in the channel in response to the wood. So what we're looking at here, and I was told to use the clicker here, is these are, these are areas of the watershed based on some work we've been doing with Lee and Sam, where the, the primary the source of the wood are going to be from the stream adjacent riparian zone as opposed to these red areas, which are going to be coming, the, most, um, the majority of wood is likely to come from upslope. So, you know, here, we're, again, we're looking at this, this area with the, with the stream adjacent uh, system. And these are generally going to be single pieces or maybe small clumps that are going to come together. This is generally, when we think of wood, how we think about it. When we look at the ecological function, we talk about the pool formations and other things that go along with it. We usually are, are referring to these conditions where we have maybe a single piece or multiple pieces that have come together, okay, Rel relatively uh, small in, in terms of their, their zone of influence. Um, and in terms of the size of the wood, okay, when there's a, there's a whole, the, the, particularly with regard to this, there's the issue of small wood. Certainly small wood can, you know, if we look at this study from, from BC uh, talking about the um, the size of wood and pool formation is what you're seeing is um, that certainly small wood uh, can form pools, okay? I mean, there's no argument about it. But, but if you look at the likelihood, it, it's relatively low um, compared to when you get larger pieces of wood. So if we're talking about the ecological function, it's not whether something can do something or not necessarily, but the likelihood that it's going to do it, okay? And so I think that's something that we need to be considering as, as we talk about these, um, the, the issues and the functions of wood. Okay, the new areas are going to be this idea of, of, of delivery from upslope. Now we've been, you know, we've, this has been well documented, particularly uh, in the last, uh, oh, last 10 years or so about the importance of landslide sources of wood. Uh, you know, before uh, landslide was a four letter word and we were out there to prevent them. You know, we didn't want, to hap we didn't want them to happen. Turns out that landslides make in, 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 in during these big disturbance events can be really important uh, ecological functions that, that uh, are going on out there that, that can have met some, some real benefits uh, to stream systems. When we look at this, we tend to be, see these major jams, okay? Uh, real large aggregations of wood at certain, generally right around the trib junction where the, the, the um, the landslide occurred. Now the other thing to keep in mind is Gordon Grant and Stephen Lancaster have done some really interesting work showing that the behavior of landslide changes dramatically with the presence or absence of wood. When you have wood in your landslide, they tend to move down slope relatively slow, slowly compared to the absence of wood. When they hit the valley bottom, they tend to, tend to set up. They don't run out, okay? So there's a, there's a real important uh, role of wood that hasn't been recognized until relatively recently. But we get these large aggregations of wood um, at these trib junctions generally following these, these major, periodically following these catastrophic events. The problem is, and in, in, in I think Dave asked the question about modeling and, and stuff, we can't predict when these things are going to happen. We can predict where they're likely to happen, but we're not going to be able to predict when they happen. But we know they will happen. And when they do, 
the signature of this, these type of events is going to be really important. Okay, and one of the things it's going to do, it's going to pond a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, gravel behind it. Um, and for many of our species, you know, particularly the salmon, where they, they, they need these, these large expanses of gravel, this is one way it happens in the, in the, in the system. Um, this is just some work that, that from Christine May's uh, dissertation that uh, looking at where sediment is stored in, in, in a land, on a watershed basis, more than half of it, almost 60% of it, is stored behind these jams. Okay, so ecologically, these are really uh, important. So instead of having these small pockets, which is what, what's going to occur uh, here with these, with these small accumulations, most of the gravel in, in these, in these um, it's in, and this is over on the central coast, uh, were, were behind, uh, behind the jams. Okay, this is work from uh, Lee and some, some of his colleagues looking at the, the depth of the pools. Okay, what we're seeing is the deepest pools in the system tend to be associated or near these, these jams, okay, the, the, these large accumulations of wood. So in terms of pool formation in the deep pools, we're most likely you're going to see them uh, uh, near these uh, near these aggregations. The headwater stream. I mean, that's somewhere where, you know, we haven't really talked about the function of wood. I just mentioned an example of um, with uh, <coughs> with the runout of, of the of, of the, uh, the debris flow that uh, em originate in, in the type of setting, okay? But one of the things uh, we know is this is based, again, from, from Christine May's work um, in, the, in the coast range, is that wood plays is really essential in these small streams. And we never, we hardly ever talk about the importance of, of wood in these streams, you know, in, in terms of even thinking about it in terms of a restoration uh, tool. And it's important because what that wood is critical for the refilling of these hollows, okay, uh, in terms of, of sediment collection and, um, and, and refilling those hollows after they've evacuated during the debris flows. And why is that important? One, it's going to be important in, with regards to um, providing habitat for amphibians and other organisms that are going to use these. I think you've probably heard from Steve Wanzell is the influence of sediment in these small channels in terms of water temperature. That presence of the, of the, the, um, the, the, the fill in these small streams is going to be really critical in terms of helping maintain water temperatures. And we need that wood in these systems, in these particular parts of the network, to begin that process of actually refilling those channels, uh, which, which will help with, with potential issues of, um, of, of water temperature. So again, looking to a part of the network that's now just really beginning to get a lot of attention. It's been really interesting. Um, we've been look, talking to people about science since the, since the inception of the Northwest Forest Plan uh, 20 years ago. It's interesting, most of the science that's been done has been on these small streams, and, and, a, and a lot of it is dealing with, with issues like this. Okay, there's other functions of wood. I think Michael touched on those that I'm not going to, um, uh, to jump into that, you know, we haven't done a lot of work on. There's been, there's been some interesting stuff, but, you know, it's, it's going to be providing, you know, uh, habitat for a, a whole suite of, of animals, um, uh, plants, and fungi, and also as an important soil component in terms of the breakdown of that wood uh, contributing to, uh, to soil. So there's other things that are just, we're just beginning to scratch the surface on with regard to that. The big question, and we heard it here, uh, you know, I've heard it asked either directly or indirectly, is how much wood do we need, okay? Um, this is a, a graph that, um, you know, came out of the report that, that we, we did uh, as part of the thinning group. And the question Michael raised it about the reference. You know, what is the reference point and how much wood do we really need? You know, generally what we're assuming is, you know, the more wood the better. But I would contend, is that really true? And what do we use as, as a reference point? You know, could it be that it's 100 percent, all the wood there, is that really what we use if we judge the ecological benefit? And, what, and how do we judge whether that 100 percent is accurate? Usually, what do we do? We go out to old growth systems or, quote, unmanaged systems, and we measure the amount of wood in, in those particular systems. 
But how many times have we measured the amount of wood and looked at the fish communities or the fish production associated with those in, in, in those where, we, where we measure those wood level? Not very many. We've just automatically, we've assumed for some reason that old growth is, is our reference conditions. I would contend that we need to challenge that assumption if we're going to move forward with thinking about wood. It may be that these are completely, these may be our better reference conditions through time. You know, the little bit of work we've done in the coast range suggests that intermediate amounts of wood well below what you find in a old growth system actually has more fish and a greater diversity of fish than what you find in, in quote, old growth systems. And so I think one of the major challenges both for us as scientists and in, in, the, in the management regulatory form is to really question that assumption about what we use uh, in terms of, of, of a reference. It may be that, you know, 100% of the, when we look at this and say it's 100% of the reference point, it, it, it's, to, it, it's totally inappropriate. So with that, I'm going to stop and entertain any questions or comments that people may have. Yeah. How do you, how do you uh, factor in management on adjacent lands when you're looking at, like you said, 100% everywhere? Yeah. Not necessarily a good thing. How do you factor in management regimes that are on the different ownerships around the federal lands? Yeah. I mean, David is asking, you know, how do we consider the aggregate? Uh, pattern of wood distribution from the different, as a result of ownership that's going in there. Um, I think what we would have to do, if, if, if we were in a perfect world, we'd have to provide some context for the different owners. I mean, are they in, a, in an area that, where the wood is coming from the stream adjacent riparian zone and are they contributing, uh, is, the, is the contribution <coughs> adequate? Are they getting wood from, you know, are, are there places on the landscape where you expect to see wood coming in via landslides? And are those being, how are those being managed? So I think you'd have to, have, you have to provide sort of a template or a context for that landscape and then overlay the management and the management either, you know, uh, actions that are going on to, to make some type of assessment. You know, the challenge becomes how do we, how do we look at, the, at a watershed scale and say there's enough wood there? I mean, that's really what it, what it comes down. And, and we're really struggling with that. I don't know how we do it other than we start to think about the individual pieces and as we aggregate them up, how do we assess them to, to, in the overall, in, in a total scheme? Um, if we want to determine the reference condition for a site based on the productivity of that site and to say that we could export some of the productivity of that site and still call it a reference condition, I'm, I'm having trouble with that. Um, I'm having, I think, I, okay. Um, the Productivity, in part, yes. Okay, so what, what you're asking, I'm assuming when you say the productivity, are you talking about the stand productivity of, of the site? Or? Like that, the, that site's capacity to grow wood. Right. Why, why shouldn't 100% of it be the reference condition? Why should 70% be the reference condition? Why, why should we be able to export some of the productivity to send it to the mill and still say that, that um, you know, we're, we're comparing it to a, to a reference condition now that is less than the productivity of that site? I'm, trying, I'm trying to think what, uh, what exactly, how to answer the question. Um, if, yeah, okay, but we, but we do, the problem is, is, is that I, I mean, I see what you're saying. You're saying, you know, if any removal of trees is going to decrease the, um, the, the overall reference, I mean, the, the, the productivity of the site because you're not getting all the wood there. Is that, is that a, like that, site can that, that site, wood, right, okay. That well, first, first of all, I think the site may be able to produce the amount of wood, but what is, once it's in the, is that a channel, is, is, that, a, is that a part of the network that can produce fish, for example? You know, one of the, one of the issues would be, and when we talk about context, is every part of the fish bearing network doesn't have the same capacity to produce fish. And so you, you could have 100% of your production going into a, a, a reach that may not be 
not, not be capable of producing many fish. And if, we, if you took 30% of the production away, you may not see an overall effect on the fish per se. Now in other cases, you may have parts of the network that are very productive for fish and losing that contribution could, could, be, be, could be quite significant. So I don't think you can simply say that by removing 30% of the trees, we're reducing the, the, the overall production by 30%. Um, because, because it, without, without considering some, some contact. But that, that's an interesting way of putting the question that I haven't heard before. Got one more back here. Okay.